We're now going to move to the sacraments or the ordinances based on your point of view. Please notice there is a difference theologically between what is called an ordinance and what is called a sacrament. An ordinance is simply, here's the key idea, a memorial. It's a remembrance. And so we use the word ordinance. Uh, a sacrament is a religious rite that conveys spiritual grace, that God mediates grace into the life of the one who uh, embraces that religious rite. Uh, so, and we'll see in a moment as, as we walk through baptism and the Lord's Supper, you will, we'll see how that plays out. Baptism is the first of the ordinance or sacraments. And let's look at it. First of all, it's institution. Uh, it's a part of the Great Commission. So therefore, it's pretty hard to get away from. It's also the practice of the New Testament church, but it's also a part of the Great Commission. Going, uh, baptizing, and teaching are the three participles that embrace make disciples. So to make a disciple, you're going, you're baptizing, and you're teaching. So it is commanded as a part of Great Commission strategy. Turn the page. It was, uh, it was a part of early church practice. It was also uh, uh, connected to other spiritual operations. Often in the book of Acts and other places, you'll find repentance, faith, and baptism always linked close to one another. Uh, if you come from a Disciples of Christ, if you come from a Christian church, if you come from Church of Christ background and all of that, you would say, well, of course you do. Because baptism is a condition of salvation. Uh, and you would appeal, as my uh, brother-in-law might appeal to me, on, uh, on the basis of Acts 2.38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And on the surface, I would say, yeah, that seems to say that very thing, that baptism closes the deal. That is not the position uh, that we hold here uh, at fellowship. As a matter of fact, in the box there, I have just a little footnote uh, in the Ryrie Study Bible, how Dr. Ryrie gives a short little answer to that. Here's another way, if you're not adverse to doing this in your notes, after the word repent in Acts 2.38, put a parenthesis. And then after the word Jesus Christ, put another parenthesis. That the, the interpretive emphasis of the passage may be repent. Now skip the parenthesis. Repent for what? For the forgiveness of sin. And that would line up with many, many other scriptures in the New Testament that say repentance and faith leads to forgiveness of sin. So the idea would be repent, and of course you're going to be baptized because people who come to faith in Jesus Christ are baptized. You see it all throughout the book of Acts. In fact, the first century, the first century would look would look with alarm and awe and, and amazement of any believer who had not been baptized. So the idea, Peter would say, on the day of Pentecost, repent and, of course, identify yourself. Jesus gave us a commission to go, make disciples, baptizing, teaching. So repent, come to faith in Christ. You'll get your forgiveness of sin in a minute. But come to faith in Christ, and, of course, you're going to be baptized as an outward expression of this inward commitment that you've made. And you can read Ryrie's notes and, and others if you wish, uh, but that would be the way that we would basically handle it. There's another part about that. That word for is in the Greek uh, could be translated. There's debate about it, but it could be translated because of. So then the idea would be repent and be baptized because of your forgiveness of sin as an outward expression, as a subsequent expression of faith and repentance. So I'll let you deal with that. I do want you to notice that on page 328 and 330, I have, of course, a chart, a two-page chart, where we have the major views on baptism. On page 328, we have the Roman Catholic view, which includes within it, it is a sacrament that transmits grace. We also have the Lutheran view, which also sees it mediating grace. On page 330, we have the Reformed view, which also has a measure of grace that is transmitted to you. And then you have the Zwinglian, or, well, uh, I shouldn't say Zwinglian, but the Baptistic view, which uh, says, no, it's only a memorial, and, and the blessing that you get in, a, in being baptized is the blessing of, of knowing that you're obedient to Christ and, and so forth. It's a spiritual blessing, but there's no grace mediated to you as you do that an unusual Holy Spirit operation. 
All right, now turn the page, if you would, on the significance of baptism. Just want to highlight a couple of things. It is an outward symbol of the inward reality. On the left-hand side of the page, a couple of questions about water baptism. I also quote uh, 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 Dr. Geisler, uh, who asked, Did Peter declare that baptism was necessary for salvation? There's that Acts 2.38. And another way of handling that particular passage, if you're interested in that. I want you to turn the page again to page 335. The modes of baptism, there are three common modes uh, that the church historically has practiced. Sprinkling, pouring, or that's sometimes called effusion, E-F-F-U-S-I-O-N. Sprinkling, pouring, or effusion, or immersing, or plunging, or, or uh, full baptism. Or you could look at it uh, this way, is that's uh, dry cleaning, uh, dripping, and uh, full immersion however you want to look at it. But those are the three common modes that we see in the Scripture. Uh, as far as uh, uh, it, it fellowship, we practice, we practice immersion as a general rule, but there have been some exceptions. Uh, I was uh, visiting a man in intensive care. He, w he had come to faith in Christ. It was very important to him he had come to faith in Christ. He was in intensive care with severe uh, physical problems, and he was uncertain about whether he was going to survive. And he wanted to be baptized. Well, we weren't going to cart him down and find some tank somewhere in the hospital. He's in intensive care. He's hooked up. And, uh, and I, uh, I just, for me, I, I just couldn't, you know, you know th to me, that, that it's hard to see death, burial, and resurrection by, for me doing that. So what I did was I took a, uh, we got a cup of water, and, uh, and we talked about it, and I poured water over the top of his head. It just went all over him, all over his sheet, and all over his pillow, and all over his head. And we practiced pouring, and I said, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, if that was wrong, the Lord can rebuke me, but, but uh, what I would say is that this is the normal, th these are the normal ways of doing it, sprinkling, pouring, or immersing. All right, let's turn the page. Who can be baptized? I'll let you decide on that, uh, the infants, true believers. We personally believe in believer's baptism here at Fellowship. Uh, we follow along with Baptists and other non-denominationalists, Bible churches, and what have you. But what I'd like for you to see is the passage in Acts chapter 16. I think this is instructive for all of us. It's the Philippian jailer. He thinks that Paul and his companions have, uh, Paul and Silas have escaped. They did not, and so he comes in, he brings some light in, verse 30. He brought them out, and he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Would you say that's a pretty clear question? Is that pretty straightforward? The answer is pretty straightforward. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household, if they believe in the Lord Jesus. Okay? Then it says later that, they spoke the word to everybody in his household, and uh, all of his family believed in the Lord Jesus, and they were baptized. So the bullet points, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus, and then he was baptized. And we think that's the biblical model, and we try to embrace that model. All right, quickly, turn the page on the Lord's Supper. I want to acknowledge once again on page 338 and 340, we have four views on the Lord's Supper. You have the uh, Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation where the elements literally become the body and the blood of Christ and that grace is mediated as you partake of the blood and the body of Christ. Uh, I have been told by some Catholics that uh, nowadays that the laity are allowed to also drink from the chalice, whereas in old Catholicism, the laity only could participate in the bread. They could not participate in the cup. That was for the priests to do on behalf of the, of the people. But in transubstantiation, the elements, the bread, the, uh, the wine, they become the literal body and blood of Christ. Now, Luther, who was a reformer, was not trying to undo the Catholic Church, just reform it. He didn't realize he was going to start a whole new Protestant revolution and then uh, uh, new churches and all that. But Luther said that the presence of Christ was in, with, around, uh, uh, surrounding the elements. That they didn't become the elements. In other words, the, the, the bread and the wine do not become the literal body. 
but it, it'd be like a red-hot poker in a fire. You pull it out, and the heat is all around it, in it, through it, and so forth, but the heat is separate from the iron. And so that's how the Lutheran, uh, the consubstantiation is, is that it's in, with, around, and under it. In the Reformed view, the Reformed view would say that, no, the presence of Christ is there. He's present within this. Grace is mediated through His presence when you partake of it. And then in the Zwinglian uh, uh, viewpoint, the Baptist or the memorial viewpoint, is that uh, the, the blessing is the blessing of remembrance, the blessing of gratitude and thankfulness for what Christ has accomplished in His death, burial, and resurrection. But there is no unusual grace mediated other than the blessings of being obedient to Christ. And that would be the, uh, that would be the uh, views on the Lord's Supper. I want us to uh, move over. Uh, I'll uh, bypass the, the things that you can read. And what I would like for us to look at is the final thing, and that is church discipline. Notice how it's described at the bottom of page 343. Many people, this is Carl Laney, one of my former professors. He says, many people fail to make a clear distinction between punishment and discipline. There's a very significant difference between the concepts. Punishment is designed to execute retribution. You are punished uh, and retribution comes because of uh, rebellion or failure or whatever it might be. Punishment executes retribution for a wrong done. Discipline, on the other hand, is to encourage restoration of the one involved in wrongdoing. So when we talk about church discipline, and on the left-hand side of the page on 342, there are several different kinds of discipline that can be enacted. When we talk about discipline or church discipline, church discipline is not uh, retribution. It's not punishing people for their failures as members of the body. What it is, is it is a restorative invitation for a person who is removed from fellowship within the church body, who are, to use the harsh word, excommunicated or taken outside of the umbrella of protection of the church in the hopes that being out there they would so miss the fellowship of the saints that they would desire to repent and be restored to their brethren in an appropriate uh, biblical sort of way. If they refuse to do that, it's the idea that Paul says, I've delivered Hymenaeus and Alexander over to Satan for him to judge them. We're taking them outside the umbrella protection of the community of the faith, uh, faithful ones in the hopes that they would one day be restored. Does that make sense to you? And so consequently, if you ask the question, do we practice church discipline at fellowship? We practice many of these kinds of different disciplines, but we also have the one where we actually tell people that you are not to come back to fellowship unless there is significant repentance, and we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis, whether or not you can be fully and completely restored to the body of Christ on the basis of the sin that caused us to, ju to, to bring judgment to bear on you in, in the first place. Uh, we have never gone before the assembled body, which we would do, and dismiss the non-members and say, we have a family decision we have to make today, which we would do. And the uh, members of fellowship would remain, we'd explain the situation, and then we would say, this person is under church discipline, we're in hopes that they'll repent, we're now going to pray for them, but we are to have no church-related fellowship with them. If you have personal friendship, you can have your personal friendship. Plead with them to be reconciled to the church, be reconciled to Christ, get their life together and all of that. But as church bodies, a community group, etc., they are now outside the umbrella protection. We've never gotten to that point, and the reason why is this. We've either had repentance or the person voluntarily say, I want nothing to do with this church, and I'm going to follow my own. I don't care if it's right. I don't care if it's wrong. I'm going to do my own thing. We do not do, as some churches would say do, we do not follow them and say, oh, no, you can't leave us. If they make that choice, then they have already excommunicated themselves. And we will tell them, <clears throat> in my mind, I'm looking right now at a particular person where I sat across the table. I said, uh, you are no longer welcome in this body in the spiritual condition in which you are in. I pray that you will find your path back to God, but you're not going to find it here. 
And if you want to personally, if you ever have a, a, a desire to come back here, and, and that's a repenting desire and so forth, we can talk privately. But as of, as of right now, we do not want you to be here. We're placing you outside the umbrella of our protection in the hopes that you will come to your spiritual senses. And uh, it has not happened in the several cases where people have left for that reason. Okay? So that's what we uh, believe about church discipline. I think the chart on the left-hand side is a lot of fuel for thought as you try to practice discipline in an appropriate kind of fashion. <clears throat> Ultimately, we walk away with one thought. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. We are simply His stewards. In acting as His body, His dictates and desires. And to be as faithful as we can, to be faithful members of the greater body of Christ. And to that end, may we be faithful. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank You for the goodness of this day. We thank You for how You have marked us out to be a part of Your wonderful body. And may we be faithful members of that body is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen.